Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Swainson, and on behalf of Lit the LitFest Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome you to this first LitFest Autumn Weekend, which, like our main festival in March, is entirely online and entirely free. Like many of you, we would like to get back to live events and are currently exploring the best way to do this so that we can continue to be inclusive and accessible and continue to reach our greatly increased and ever more diverse audiences. The hybrid format of live and live streamed events does look like the best way forward. Now, as a registered charity with no regular Arts Council funding, if LitFest is to be able to go on creating exciting projects and events right here in Lancaster, bringing the best in world literature and ideas to the northwest of England and to our international audiences, we're going to need your help. To, towards the end of the event, a donate button will appear on your screen. Please do make use of it or visit our website afterwards, www.litfest.org. Every donation will help us to build towards that hybrid future where we can be together both digitally and physically as suits us best. So why an autumn weekend? Well, we are building LitFest capacity so that we can run more projects all the year round. Projects like the poetry map, the documentary films, the discussion panels, the big read campaign and the writing workshops that we piloted at LitFest 2021. And of course, when we realised during LitFest 2021 that four of our local authors, Sarah Hall, Polly Atkin, Kim Moore and Karen Lloyd, all had new books coming out in September and October, it seemed the only right and obvious thing to do. And in addition, we co-created the Poetry Mosaic with poets of all ages from the Northwest and launched it on Thursday this week on National Poetry Day with a great reading hosted by Hannah Hodgson. Those of you who were hoping to hear Sarah Hall um, last night will know that she was ill, but that we are rescheduling and we will let you know um, the, the new date as soon as we know it. It'll be early next week that we'll know. And last night we had Kim Moore and Polly Atkin reading from their wonderful new collections, All the Man I, Men I Never Married and um, Much With Body. And today I'm delighted to say that we can welcome Karen Lloyd. Karen, as I'm sure many of you will know, is a writer of nonfiction, poetry and journalism. Abundance is her third work of nonfiction. It's published by Bloomsbury and you can buy it direct from the LitFest online bookshop. And that will also help support LitFest's efforts. She's also the author of The Gathering Tide, A Journey Around the Edgelands of Morecambe Bay and of The Blackbird Diaries, um, both published by Saraband. Um, <clears throat> among uh, both books won prizes at the Lakeland Book of the Year Awards and Karen is also an environmental activist and edited and published the anthology Curlew Calling to raise awareness of the perilous state of Britain's lowland curlews. She's currently writer in residence in, at Lancaster University's Future Places Centre and she lives in Cumbria. So welcome, Karen. Thanks, Bill. Lovely to be here on this very beautiful morning. It, it is. It's a bit grey where I am, but I'm hoping the sun will come along later. <laughs> now, I want to begin. Um, I would like you to talk about um, your book and the way the way it's sh it shaped, because it's a set of essays, and perhaps to read from it. <clears throat> but I'd just like to start with this wonderful quote from Sir Tim Smith, um, who is, of course, co-founder of the Eden Project, and the Eden Project is behind Eden North. The, the, um, the project for um, developing a, an, Eden, an Eden centre on Morecambe Bay. He says, abundance is a little masterpiece carrying an important message. It is a visceral, if elegant plea that happiness lies in knowing what you look at, like the colours in a tiny bird's eyes, where observation exists as the passport to truth. 
Lloyd's book holds out the gateway to a new world. So over to you, Karen. So um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll begin by talking about where the genesis of the book lies. Um, and really there were, there were two themes behind this. Um, the first of which was um, that I, I think along with a lot of people, felt this um, tidal wave or tsunami of um, terrible news about what we're doing to the environment and about losses in biodiversity, losses of habitats. You know, you can't open the paper without encountering another example of what we're doing to the planet. And um, I, I almost got to a point where I couldn't um, look at this anymore. Um, um, it, you know, it is significantly overwhelming and I think many of us feel that. But as somebody who um, is, um, you know, I live in Cumbria, I'm, I'm kind of aware of lots of environmental um, concerns. I was also aware that there are many, many people all over the globe who are turning this idea of loss on its head or the inevitability of loss, should I say. Um, and we're just quietly getting on with restoring habitats or restoring species that were on the edge of extinction. And so I thought um, what I wanted to do was to use the book as an opportunity to go and learn about some of those projects, um, learn about some of those places, and then use the writing as a way to tell their stories. The other bit um, of, of where it came from was that a friend of mine, Astrid, uh, Hardwick, who lives in Ulverston, uh, was brought up in the Harz Mountains in Germany and her brother worked as an um, international forestry inspector and years before it had arrived into the sphere of the Western press, um, he would told Astrid about wolves travelling back across Europe on the back of legal protection. So once the um, EU had ratified um, you know, the, prote the protection of wolves um, to stop people indiscriminately shooting them, um, they, guess what, began to expand their range. And they, they kind of carried out this pincer movement, traveling south into Europe from Poland and, um, and then coming the other way from the French Alps. And they were re-inhabiting places that they rightly belonged in, but from where they'd been absent for about 150 years. And I knew that I wanted to write about this. This was such a powerful image of what we can do. That's not to say that wolves um, and people um, don't necessarily always rub along in the right way, but we'll come to that later in the discussion. But um, I, I just thought that, you know, there, there are many, many ways of looking at the natural world. And we needed to get away from the idea that loss was inevitable because it simply isn't. And then um, I got the opportunity through a scholarship at Lancaster to undertake a PhD in creative writing. And I wanted to use the literary essay as the form of address uh, for these um, ideas and concerns. So um, the, the, the book is the creative product of that PhD. That's great. Now, <clears throat> we were talking earlier and we've, we've sort of given ourselves a number of themes um, for discussion mm -hmm. that, are, that are sort of a way into the book. And one of the first of these is you, you use the, the phrase ways of seeing, mm -hmm. which for, for me particularly, and certainly my generation, I would say immediately sums up the, the thought of John Berger and that wonderful mm -hmm. art program. Mm -hmm. But um, you have, uh, you're taking it much further than that. Um, I wonder if you just talk about what you mean about ways of seeing and why it's so important. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, John Berger, he, he talked about how um, the, the time collapses between, when, when you look at a painting, um, time collapses between when it was made and when the viewer looks at it. And I suppose part of what I was doing was um, allowing time to expand and then collapse again into this into this essay, you know, allowing almost to live again, I suppose. Um, and then I was very um, interested in Roland Barthes' ideas, and in his book *Camera Lucida*, he writes about 
the old fashioned, the first cameras that were coach built and made out of wood um, and, and beautiful objects too. But he talks about them uh, as clocks for seeing because time is built into the wood that the cameras were made out of. And again, I thought that was such a lovely, generous idea for thinking about the essay as a clock for seeing and how it deals with time, way, how you can structure an essay, how I can structure the journeys and bring that back into my um, study and then start to um, place those stories into um, the shape of an essay. So that was all interesting. And then, of course, there's, there, you know, the book, the book started as... Um, and, and quite naively, really, as a way of avoiding loss. And I just didn't want to go there. I thought this book is going to be about hope. It's not going to tell any of these negative stories. And of course, you get so far in and you realise that's just not possible. You cannot have one without the other. One needs to feed and inform the other. So if we're going to talk about the, the fact that Britain is the most nature depleted country in the G7 with 70 percent biodiversity loss since the 1970s, then we have to talk about the instruments um, of loss, really. Um, and, and so actually what happened was the book became, became a kind of weighing scale of abundance and loss, very much with the focus on the idea of abundance, where it exists, why it exists, the ways of seeing that people um, have chosen to look to either lead towards loss because they've looked through the lens of capitalism, and um, particular ways of behavior um, and then the lens of well what do we do about this you know and the, the lens of repair so there's all these kind of themes going on um, um, and, and you know there's this idea that humans and the natural world are completely separate from each other and of course that's entered really it's really entered mainstream narratives at the moment and um, and, I, and I think I've got two responses to that. One is that philosophically, uh, biologically, yes, we are absolutely um, we're deeply entangled part of constituents of the natural world. But that the but, but that many of the problems have come about of the way that we've been disenfranchised from it. And there are many many um, reasons um, that we've become disenfranchised. Um, in, in the first essay in the book, which is called A Primer for Abundance, I kind of get into some of these ideas, one of which is really a kind of forlorn um, uh, way of seeing that is British education and how narrow the focus is and how we could, if we wanted to, use the natural world as a kind of um, hedge fund for um, assimilating biodiversity into children's lives. Um, later in the book, I talk about the fact um, that Senegalese um, ecologist, Baba Dioum, um, who talks about the fact that you can't save what you don't love. And of course, you can't, you can't love what you don't know. So, you know, this, this all feeds into different ways of seeing. Um, I had the great good fortune to spend some time with an ecologist from Natural England going out looking at Lake District landscapes that were actually under repair. Um, and, you know, so that that was another way of seeing, you know, here, here you've got this cultural landscape. Um, it's actually a very degraded landscape. If you look uh, into and read, as I have the um, World Heritage Inscription document, you will find in there that it states quite clearly that the uplands of the Lake District are in very poor condition. Um, and, and yet still we can turn that around if we choose to look at it differently. And so this idea of restoring wood pasture, bringing in cattle rather than the predominance of sheep. Um, and so this, this all kind of, um, it, it, it's all fed into the book. And, and, um, and then apart from the local investigations, I also go to a number of countries in Europe, um, such as Hungary. I went to southern Spain a couple of times um, and um, northern Greece on the border between uh, Macedonia and Albania. So a very remote part of Greece called the Prespa Lakes. And, um, and then to uh, Transylvania in Romania. And, um, and yes, I did go to Dracula's castle. 
um, on a day off, but um, we we spent significant amount of time in the mountains with um, forest rangers, looking at um, you, you know you know you, you kind of compare that as a lens and a way of looking um, the idea of restoring bits and pieces of the Lake District to restoring boreal forests on a massive scale in the Carpathian Mountains, because those people had chosen to look at it through the lens of what nature gives back to humans. Um, and so, yeah, so the book became a series of journeys. The very last one was going to be to the States to visit um, a friend over there who was um, running a project sorry, involved in a project to regenerate the ocean food chain, which to me is just kind of mind-blowingly incredible. But then COVID got in the way, and so um, I wasn't able to write that, and did some other things instead. But, um, yeah, so, yeah. That's great. Now, that's an awful lot of ground to cover, but it gives us an idea that the book has both a local setting but was also a very international aspect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if we can come back to the particular for a minute would you like to read the um the passage very near the beginning of the book yep where you're talking about um you're, you're thinking about abundance and you tell us about the british artist mary newcomb yeah and um Mary Newcomb, if you haven't, uh, if, if, if viewers haven't come across her work, then I recommend you go and look her, her up because she has a very idiosyncratic way of looking at the natural world. I'm thinking about abundance and how many ways there are to see when I read a book on the British artist Mary Newcomb and I find a painting called A Football Match Seen Through a Hole in an Oak Leaf Eaten by a Caterpillar. When I first look at this painting, I don't understand why this title or why this image of a leaf gnawed by a blue-black hairy caterpillar, four of which hang from threads above the leaf, like circus performers suspended by ropes, have anything to do with football. After some time, my eye eventually distinguishes a tiny football net and a pink-shirted player off to one side of the leaf and another pink-shirted player on the other. These miniature manifestations of the human world behave as a guide that helps my eye find the small hole in the middle of the leaf through which now I've begun to understand some of the ways that this artist sees. More of the football players become visible. A couple of them hold their arms high and in the air above their heads is the tiny sphere of the football itself. When my eye tunes in to another person's way of seeing, I begin to see the world differently. The hole in the leaf is a way for both artist and viewer to consider the thingliness of the subjects under observation, a lens through which we are invited to view the world, its various perspectives and distances. If I look at the middle distance through a hole eaten into a leaf, what might I see that I wouldn't otherwise? I want to bend closer towards the natural world, to pay it close attention, because attention to the natural world has not been abundant in the Anthropocene, the current geological age during which human activity is the dominating influence on our climate and environment. The word attention is derived from the Latin to stretch towards. I want to bend or stretch not only toward all the holes in all the leaves, but also towards the holes humans have created during the Anthropocene. I need to work out what I've not been looking at but should have been. I want to pay attention. In the field of ornithology, birders talk about getting your eye in. It means to become skillful because you have practiced the visual and auditory and the factual fields of birds. I look up the expression online at home and my eye is caught by an article further down the screen about how to flush something out of your eye. What do we need to see and what do we need to flush out? An overwhelming amount of biodiversity has been flushed away because of our collective actions. Sometimes this flushing might manifest in tears. I might weep because of all the losses, but this weeping won't do me or the world any good. When my sons leave home, there is a logic to the tears I weep. For both of us, it is a rite of passage, 
part of the necessary act of being in the world. Everything is connected. When Callum first left home, my tears fell for two days. Then I put on the biohazard suit, opened the door and went in to tackle his room. When I turn on the news or read a newspaper, I am assailed by all the losses in the natural world. The natural world is being flushed out. In the natural world, there are no rites of passage to cope with this. Sometimes, frequently in fact, I'm overwhelmed by all the losses and the reporting of all the losses. And what I want to do is get my eye in in a different way. I want to use my binocular vision to look at and think about abundance and what that might mean in the Anthropocene. I want to take my binoculars into the field and see if it is still possible to see abundance or something like it. And if I come across it, I want to know what kinds of looking were employed to keep that abundance in place or help build it back up again, or that challenge the inevitability of loss. If I push or pull on my binoculars thumb screw, the focus wheel that helps me get my eye in, will it be abundance or loss that comes more into view? Thank you, Karen, for that terrific reading. And it gives it gives us all an idea of <clears throat> uh, the range of the book and just how you use your skill as an essayist to go in close on a subject, then draw back and see the bigger picture. And I think um, if we could move on now to talk about <clears throat> the impact of human beings, we will come back to this at the end. There's, there's, um, um, but just for now, there's a little quote I'd like to read to you, which comes from an essay by John Fowles, the famous novelist of um, The Collector and The Magus and Daniel Martin, um, and of course, French Lieutenant's Woman, who wrote this essay, oh, must be in the 1970s or very early 1980s. And in it, he says, <clears throat> he's talking about the way in which humans seem to think of themselves as one thing and nature as another thing. He says, we shall never understand nature or ourselves until we dissociate the wild from the notion of usability, however innocent and harmless the use. Now that's quite a tough statement, and it's you know it's um, when you're when you're talking about these issues like biodiversity and species loss and so on, there is also bearing in mind that human beings are part of the natural world. It is part of the natural world's desire to procreate and increase and to feed your family and look after yourselves and move to where you need to 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 work or to to gain your living so this is a quite a conundrum isn't it yes and and it it, it is absolutely um um and and i'm not an economist and i'm not a scientist you know i'm somebody who's kind of struggling with all this stuff myself as well um, and we kind of live in a world at the moment where, where um, if you're reading about this stuff, um, um, that, and I guess probably most people listening in today are, every single act that we undertake, everything that we buy, has a, a, um, a set of meanings ascribed to it. And so I think we're all, in a way, carrying this idea um, of guilt around with us now, you know, and, 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 you know, I didn't sign up for this in the 1960s when I was a kid growing up. I didn't sign up for this. But in the 1960s, food cost 50% more than it costs now. That's why we had a roast chicken, you know, once a fortnight or once a week. And that's why we had leftovers. Um, because people, uh, that, that was how most people needed to live. And, and then came along the EU, and then things start to get interesting. And I'm not in any way, shape or form pro-Brexit. But what the EU subsidies did was something that the, what was never intended, and, uh, the, and the consequences of which have, are, are an ongoing, unmitigated environmental disaster. And that is that the way they um, reshaped asked farmers to, to, to learn a different way to look at their land, which was tied to productivity. And then the first consequence of that is that we ended up having food mountains that we didn't know what to do with. You know, well, what, well, what a shocking way to be in the world. And then, um, and then on the back of that came the loss 
of, uh, I, th I think I'm right in saying, and somebody might put me right on this, but 70% of insect biomass loss, it can be it, it, it directly attributed to changes in agricultural practice. So um, that's all pretty grim, isn't it? You know, but what we are learning is that we don't have to live in that way. There are different ways to live. There are different ways to farm. And and just as we all kind of carry this this guilt within us, um, um, we, we also carry a, a, this, this other kind of um, messages coming through that it really does not have to be like this. There are ways to change. Um, and so that was why I wanted to go and um, meet some of the people who are doing these amazing projects. Um, and um, I'll give you a little example. Um, when I was in Hungary, um, I have a friend who's a wildlife artist um, and he, Sabi, and he very kindly set up a number of visits in Hungary. Um, it was the first time I'd been to the country. And, um, and, and um, Hungary is lots of small towns stitched together by masses and masses of industrial agriculture. And in amongst these kind of agricultural deserts, there are little oases where people are just quietly getting on, restoring um, animals and birds and I went to meet um, a guy called Tomash who runs a meadow adder breeding program and we drove through this little wood and we came out in a little um, a, a clearing in the wood next to surrounded by massive agribusiness fields and um, Tomash breeds meadow adders because they're on the verge of extinction um, and he, I describe him in the book, I think, as looking like a, a mashup between Roy Rogers and Alice in Wonderland because he's kind of dressed in a check shirt and he's got a kind of cowboy sun hat on because it's quite hot and denim jeans. And he's about my age, I guess. And then he's holding this pipe, which looks a bit like a hooker pipe, um, a pipe with lots of bulbous um, protrusions coming from it, a ceramic pipe. And what that is is um, uh, um, it's a hab it's a habitation for meadow adders to um, enter the state of brumation, which is where they're getting into their uh, hibernation. Um, but this, the winters have been warmer in Hungary, and so on the ground level, um, many years they're not able to get into this state. So Tomáš digs pits and buries these pipes in, and then in the meadow adders go. And then they can get into the state of brumation and go into hibernation and then they'll live to, to see the next year. And, and so that that in itself is a particular way of seeing and understanding the world. But also then they release meadow adders into the surrounding fields and what they've done. They've kind of had this panopticon view where they've said, OK, well, if we're going to release them, we need to make sure that the habitat is right. Otherwise, there's no point. So uh, they talk to landowners and they put back ditches and field margins. And as soon as you do that, you bring back all the right habitat and you bring back all the right conditions for, for food. And, and that kind of intricate, wonderful web begins to reestablish itself. Whether the adders ever survive is a different matter because they, you can attach tags to adders, but it's very expensive. And, and, and anyway, who wants to do that? You know, so it's a kind of act of faith, really. And then also in Hungary, um, I met uh, Imre Feta, who um, runs the um, Imperial Eagle project, the Eastern Imperial Eagle. This um, wonderful, incredible eagle was persecuted almost to extinction. I think there were about 12 birds left in the whole of Hungary, mainly through hunting activities. Um, and and it was almost as if the birds learned that they were being persecuted. So they were moving over the borders into neighboring countries and um but when the persecution was addressed they started to move back in and they and the project built habitats for them so we were driving around um these massive fields going to look for eagle territories and finding them and imre had um all the information logged on an ipad you know and these banks of data and and that was fascinating to me. It was, it, and, and when we sat in a cafe later and looked at these incredible maps of data, it, I felt as if um, we were being archaeologists because each layer revealed more and more information about um, where birds had been found poisoned, where um, habitats were, where um, the birds' territories were. 
um, where eagle chicks had hatched, where they'd fledged, you know, and you go on, you build this picture. And, um, and in the end, they kind of recruited hunting groups, police, volunteers, high court judges, you name it, vets, and everybody was working together because they recognised the cultural value of a species that if it went extinct, then it went extinct on their watch. And, you know, to bring the hunting fraternity back into that debate was extraordinary. That's a, um, a number of very good points there. One of the one of the things I think we should focus on next is Europe being a large continent and the movement of animals being um, uh, possible there in a way that mm. Britain being an island is mm -hmm. less possible. Birds, mm -hmm. birds and butterflies can get here mm. rather more easily than mm -hmm. animals. Mm -hmm. In your chapter on the, in your essay on the, on the, uh, on the wolf called to mm -hmm. receive the wolf there's a little passage on page 41 which i wonder if you would like to read because it focuses particularly on the situation in the uk and then when we've we've talked about that we can we can expand our view again and move yeah. out into the bigger world yeah 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 um so i should just say that i i actually wanted to, so this essay is called to receive the wolf um and and we'll come back to that title when, when we chat on afterwards. In the UK, we have obliterated even the thought of return. After however many thousands of years of evolution, is this really the point at which we have arrived? And where did it come from, this notion that causing the last of anything is good and that preventing its return is courageous? How then should we think of an endling, the very last individual of a species, like Martha, the passenger pigeon living out its restricted final days in a zoo, the last one of what had literally been billions. Should we think of them as powerless and ruined or as heroic, overflowing with the tenets of our failures towards their cultural, imaginative and ecological significance? At the first hint of reintroduction, our land managers and our governments roll out the rhetoric on why there's no longer any room no appetite, you might say, for returning a wolf, a lynx or a beaver. But that is complicit in denying a species its ability to restore a world in which we have forgotten how to live. A last wolf here, a last wolf there. The effortlessness of tuning out the ecological reality of the natural world. This is the crux of the issue. We can talk about anything as long as we don't also have to live with it. Instead, we impose ourselves as apex predator and look where that's got us. No one suggested we got rid of ourselves, yet that, the scientists say, won't take much longer because of the hash we've made. Talk about sh shooting yourself in the foot. Thank you. Now, that phrase, restoring a world in which we have forgotten how to live, Mm. is one of the many resonant phrases and make, is what makes these essays you've written so so powerful um now <clears throat> in the um in the chapter where you take yourself off to extremadura which is the yeah the region in spain the, the southern spain that borders portugal uh -huh. um fascinating um often quite arid region um you you talk at a certain point about um da vinci and his notebooks and mm -hmm. the point at which he he writes himself a note to tell himself what he as a scientist must do next which is to understand the mechanics of flight in a bird mm -hmm. and then of course being da vinci is it possible for that to become something humans could do um i wonder if you would just read from on page 71 at the bottom where it says i wonder what leonardo might have to say about all this progress to the end of your your imagined note um about what he would have written today yeah yeah so just just to just as a preamble i i found um an essay that incorporated how Leonardo had written these instructions to himself about how he will observe a bird 
uh, he used to buy birds from markets i think not not um you know something that many artists did to try and understand actual movement so that, that could inform their paintings so that's how i got into this um kind of um uh where this little bit came from and Leonardo's notebooks are referred to earlier in the essay. I wonder what Leonardo might have to say about all this progress. After all, his was a mind consumed by the idea of progress and the building of a world in which the lot of humans was expanded, improved, engineered, calculated, exacted, energised and above all, wondrous. I imagine he might write down some instructions for us, something along the lines of, you will make a diagram of all the wind farms and all the birds migratory routes and the feeding areas and the general flying areas. And when you have done all this, you will map one onto the other and you will consider above all the marvelous, wondrous world of flight that you will never ever replicate despite my many drawings and diagrams. And you will agree to limit the demands you place upon this world. And yes, you will even need to limit the numbers of yourselves because your demand generally outstrips natural capacity and because otherwise what lies ahead for you and the natural world is an, ab is an ab abyss. Is that where you wanted me to stop, Bill? Yeah, that's the right place. Yeah. I mean, you, there's, there's lots of interest in the rest of the essay, um, but it was just that point that you you again you you take on the voice of da vinci to say something that that we all need to hear um in the same chapter um the same essay which is which is the one about extremadura and the vultures um you t you use the phrase um of the idea of measuring the bird losses you've been talking about wind turbines the bird losses against the gains in clean energy uh -huh, and it's uh -huh. that um that mathematics or that algebra that we have to uh -huh. we have to to work out it's a you know there's no clean or uh -huh. perhaps straightforward answers but we need to find a way a bit like the dutch government with the introduction of the wolf um we need to find a pragmatic way um to 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 find solutions i wondered if you'd like to comment on that yeah, so um, basically what, what's happened is that um, um, a lot of wind farms um, are really impacting on migratory birds um, and uh, the, the, the big wind farm off the coast of Cumbria is on the direct uh, migratory route of geese and swans. Um, swans in particular fly very low to the surface of the earth, um, so it's inevitable that there are going to be bird strikes. And whether you like it or not, the people who are responsible for monitoring strikes are the people who own the, the turbines. So there's a conundrum that we need to deal with. Um, but yes, yeah, so in in um, in Spain, what's been happening is they've had operatives watching uh, wind turbines, and when they see a large bird approaching, it might be a crane or very often a vulture, um, because that that southern tip of Spain is is a major migratory route from Africa back into Europe and vice versa, and so they operate what they call shut down on demand, and and it's a kind of great metaphor really, as as well as being a practical way of dealing with the situation. You know, if only we could shut down on demand, you know, where, where we place ourselves that sometimes we shouldn't be doing. I think that would be a help. Um, but, you know, and, and really Extremadura was the first research trip I made. And when I saw the amounts of birds that inhabit the landscape there, this wonderful Dehesa cork forest and the agricultural fields, big, big, massive agricultural fields, but there's still food in the fields and there's still habitat for birds. So, so it's really a phenomenal place for, for a variety. I realised, though, Bill, we didn't we didn't go back to talk about the title of To Receive the Wolf. And maybe we should just address that for a minute now. Well, hang on. Hang did on you just want to go second. back to that? You, 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 I, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting your flow. Yeah. No, if you can just hang on a second, because I, yeah. um, I'm going to deal with that. Ah, in okay. about two or three minutes but before we get no there yeah once again um you've shown very clearly 
um, the international aspect of all the problems we're dealing with. But before we talk about the possible t title for your book, oh, yeah. which is now called Abundance, mm. and talk about other books that we and the audience listening to you um, mm -hmm. value the, in this area, I'd like just, to, if, if you will, to bring the focus back very locally to the Lake District. Mm -hmm. And on page 123, mm -hmm. there is just that paragraph um, after the little illustration of the flying geese yeah. that begins sometimes in the lakes. If you would like to read that. Yeah. Um, maybe even going to page top of page 124. That would yeah. be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes in the lakes and the tarns where I like to swim, there's another kind of blue, the blue-green of algal bloom. The Environment Agency and the Lake District National Park tell us that this algal bloom is a naturally occurring phenomenon. That is true in the same way that cholera is a naturally occurring phenomenon. They tell us this because they do not want us to worry. Algal blooms are made up of cyanobacteria, kind of naturally occurring photosynthetic organism. It ranges apparently from unicellular and filamentous to colony forming species. I like those words, unicellular, filamentous. Sometimes I imagine my thinking has become filamentous. Some types of blue-green algae produce toxins and you cannot tell whether it is toxic or not by looking at a harmful algal bloom. Toxic to me, or to wildlife, or to the dog over there that is now swimming through the water to fetch the stick I threw in before I'd even noticed the blue-green bloom. One website tells me that in humans, algal blooms have been known to cause rashes after skin contact and illnesses if swallowed. I know this to be true because once, before any of us swimmers knew what algal bloom was or what it might do, I swam through the blue-green scum. My skin began to burn, then it came up in large blotches of red, and some of them began to blister. I thought if I stayed in the cooling water, it would stop, but it didn't. I had seen the blue-green water and hadn't known, and anyway, if I had known, apparently you can't tell, only by looking. I got out of the water and drove to the doctor's. He couldn't tell. He poked the blotches and asked how long I'd had them, and more of those kinds of questions because in those days, even doctors didn't know the right kinds of questions to ask. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, we've seen in the course of um, your talk about various parts of the, of the book, Karen, just how um, flexible and brilliant a form the essay can be for talking about all these things and bringing them into uh, bringing them into focus. Now, you wanted to tell us about the title of the book, um, mm -hmm. or rather the title of the the essay on the wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the wolf was the last bit of the jigsaw, really, having been part of the reason that the book, um, w um, I wanted to write the book, to actually get at the right wolf people was really difficult. Um, early on, I spoke to a wolf scientist in Germany and he put me in touch with scientists all over Europe. Um, and they were all really busy, serious fieldwork people, none of whom were able to, 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 to give me any time. And that was very frustrating. But of course, you have to respect when people are getting on with um, th their work and important work. And eventually I got to um, meet um, the group that I refer to as the wolf people in the Netherlands and spent some time with them and um, went to a conference that was, uh, the conference was about wolves and golden jackal. And the interesting thing there was that the wolf was moving back into Holland. It was never introduced or reintroduced. It, it arrived under its own steam. They knew it was coming um, because they had been seen in Eastern, Ger Western Germany, very near the, the Dutch border. They'd been in Belgium. And because they're a wild species, they were kind of crossing the border and people didn't really know, but they knew they were coming. Um, and the first trip I made to uh, the Netherlands, I went to look at a bison uh, introduction project on the North Sea coast. And the ecologist that I spent time with there had 
told me that wolves had already arrived, um, but that the information was being kept secret for the time being because they didn't want to raise hysteria or, or alarm unnecessarily. And actually there were, um, I, I write in the book about the film of the first wolf ever seen in the Netherlands. Um, and it was running through an industrial zone. And I talk about how the wolf looked bewildered um, and how it looked as if it had been delivered through a portal, you know, from another time, which in a way it had. Um, but anyway, all these little wolf stories started um, gathering momentum. And um, one of them um, was that the one of the first wolves was found dead at the side of the road and, and, it, and it looked for all intents and purposes as if it had been run over. But it hadn't. It had been shot and then the body had been moved to make it look as if it had been run over. So the persecution was um, already beginning to happen. Um, and so the other animal at this conference was the gold that was being talked about at the conference was the golden jackal, which was an animal traveling northwards from the Balkans and into the rest of Europe and was being seen in the Netherlands for the very first time. Um, and what was interesting here was um, that only one golden jackal had been seen in the Netherlands. And yet these scientists and ecologists have a conference to decide and think about and philosophize about what the return, what the arrival of the golden jackal meant for them as a country. And um, we had a golden jackal specialist from Austria who took us into the forest, um, bioacoustic surveying for golden jackal, um, uh, which means giving the call of the jackal and waiting to see if you get a response. And we knew there was hardly any um, possibility of a response because there's only been one animal and possibly a second um, identified. But anyway, at the conference, I was introduced to Peter Venemer, who was a scientist um, who was given the job of working with the Netherlands government to philosophically consider what the return of the wolf meant for the people of the Netherlands and, and to plan how they would receive the wolf. And this expression, um, I think I write in the book about how my eyes widened and Peter said, what, what, what's the problem? And I said, you're telling me mm. that your government sat around a table and had conversation and considered philosophically what the return of the wolf meant. And he said, yes, what other way would we have done it? And again, and again it kind of, for me, um, you know, um, I'm frequently embarrassed to be English these days. And there you go. You know, like, why do we have to get into histrionics? Why do we have to kind of go into shock and alarm mode when there are different ways to think about these things? And it comes back to the book's central um, theme, which is about ways of seeing. So I was very keen to call the book to receive the wolf. But unfortunately, I was overruled by my publishers. Um, because the, because I wanted the book to speak to this whole theme of reception and how we of humans, as humans, how we think about all these different complex um, issues, what kinds of demands they might they may might place on our imagination as human beings. Um, and anyway, there you go. You have to live with some things in life, and it's just great to have the book out in the world. Well, thank thank you for that very candid response, Karen. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do um, next is to invite um, is to, to invite our audience, and I'm going to put a message up in the chat in a second, to invite our audience to answer this next question I'm going to put to you, Karen, which is, if you had to name three books that readers might like to read that would open up this view of the world, this different way of seeing the world, and expand our imaginations. Can you tell me what they would be? Me, me, I'm going first, am I right? Okay. Um, well, I yeah. can go first if you prefer. No, it's fine. I think, um, yeah, I've got three here um, and all do very different things and all addressing the same kinds of themes, but in very different ways. The first is by Nicole Walker, who is a professor of creative writing in the States and, a, and another, another brilliant essayist. And um, it's called Sustainability, A Love Story. And what I like about this book is the way the self is implicated all the time. It's something I've tried to do in my book as well. You know, it's something that the essay allows you to do. 
Um, there's a great line in Jonathan Franzen's book, The End of the End of the Earth, where, he, where he, he talks about the essay as a mirror and not liking what he's seeing in this particular mirror. So the essay allows you to kind of, um, you know, to be that fallible narrator, to, to, um, to interrogate yourself within the framework of what, what you're arguing. And, and Nicole does this incredibly well in sustainability. She deals with all sorts of issues about climate change in the States um, and brings in the sort of the self and the family and culpability um, and how, how humans might or might not be reacting. So there's one. The second is um, Notes from an Apocalypse by Mark O'Connell, who is an Irish writer and um and he basically he goes in search of um the end of the world and um and 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 goes to meet end of the world preppers and um and uh, goes to look at the places that billionaires are buying up in New Zealand where they think it's going to be the the place to live you know when society's finally crumbled into tiny pieces um and he he does this with a, with a a great deal of wry humor and I think as a way of writing and negotiating all this stuff, that really helps the reader. Um, there's a great bit where he goes into a Scottish Glen in Allerdale, which is the place um, owned by Paul Lister. Where I actually went to talk to him about his desire to reintroduce wolves, which is not going to happen and it shouldn't happen for various reasons. But um, And so Mark O'Connell has to spend 24 hours on this hillside as part of this retreat and um, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. You know, how do we just look at the world and be in it? You know, and 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 he's really good at having his, his a go at himself about that. Um, so I've mentioned accidentally another one, which was the Jonathan Franzen. But then and then an extremely powerful book, which does not shy away from any of this stuff, is on Time and Water by Andre Magnuson, uh, who's an Icelandic writer. And to give you a flavour of the book, he talks about. Oh, he asks the question, he's asked to write a memorial to a glacier that is melting away. And he asks the question, what is Iceland when the glaciers have gone? Land? Question mark. You know, it's like, of course, you know, Iceland is the place of glaciers. And if they're melting, what does that mean for, the, for, for a nation? So um, very powerful writing, very humanely written. So I recommend, they're my recommendations. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And now we're, we're, the clock is ticking down and it's time to go to the Q&A. Um, I haven't dodged the obligation to make suggestions. I've put them up in the chat, Karen. But you know that we yeah. talked the other day about The Hot Topic by David King and Gabriel Walker, Farmageddon by Philip Limbury and The Sixth Extinction by Pulitzer Prize winner Elizabeth Colbert. Mm. So to the questions, the first one comes from Kim Smith. Are humans and the natural world not deeply entangled? Perhaps this is the most dire way to describe us, given the need to include a sense of hope so that action can be inspired. Bill, you, you've kind of froze um, in the early part of that. Could you repeat it, please? I'm so sorry. OK, if you click on your, you'll see a thing called ask a question at the bottom of your oh, screen. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get the written version. Might be better than me reading it again. Oh, yeah. Are humans in the natural world not more than just deeply entangled? Perhaps this is the most bio way to describe us, given the need. Huh. Well, well, we could talk about that for a long time, couldn't we? Um, yes, I mean, I think humans, of course, um, we, we, you know, we... We evolved, didn't we, um, uh, to live a life as hunter-gatherers, and, and and we've been on a continuum ever since then. Um, and as hunter-gatherers, we existed largely by killing other things. So there's a kind of history to this, I guess. But um, I think I'm not quite sure I understand the question properly. But I think if we don't learn to look differently and to understand our place in the environment differently then we're not going to succeed, really. And I think um, we're kind of now realising this. It calls for many, many different ways to, to be in the world and to think about it. Um, and I come back to this idea of education. You know, where where are we educating young people 
um, to 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 do what we need them to do. And I think a lot of young people feel incredibly frustrated that this is what we've we have left them. You know, Greta Thunberg talks about this. You know, she says you you have stolen my childhood, and um, you know this is deeply deeply problematic stuff. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what comes out of the COP26 and whether or not the UK is capable of um, of giving any meaning to that. I don't know. Okay. Now, the next question comes from Jennifer Woodward and it reads, do you reflect on the question of human overabundance in the book? Um, yes, there is a, um, um, a, a bit about the kind of the growth in population. Yes, absolutely. And I do also realise and I take from this question that abundance, can, you know, abundance isn't necessarily a good thing. You know, um, abundance might be um, mosquitoes giving people in Africa malaria. You know, that's a kind of abundance, isn't it? Um, but but the book for me, what the book needed to be was a way of saying this is a very problematic but very precious thing and I, I'm inviting people to look at it in a way that perhaps helps us negotiate where we go next or how we go next or where, you know, what we do. Mm. Okay, and the last question that we have at the moment is what was the reason given by the publisher for wanting you to change the title of the wolf essay, or rather the title, the mean the title of the book? Yeah. Um, oh, you know, I think, I guess, um, marketing, and that they wanted it to have a title that was immediately accessible. Um, um, and, and, and it was disappointing because I felt that the title, To Receive the Wolf, was much more, framed the book in a kind of more philosophical um arena but it wasn't to be so yeah hmm. okay and um from ellie you mentioned that our education system could be transformed if it was rooted in an understanding of the natural world what would you primarily change within the education system so i'd say two things to this one of the essays in the book is about landscape and habitat repair in the cairngorms the Cairngorms Connect project, um, and also talks about the Capitale. Um And one of the things that I learned when I was researching that essay was that the Gaelic language is founded upon trees, um, species of trees and, um, and uh, shrubs from the Scottish environment. And um, that was a kind of revelation to me that, that the actual foundations of language arose from the natural world. And I thought that was an extraordinary moment, really. And I thought, well, yes. And I think I say in, in the essay, you know, we can do this too if we want to. We could, couldn't we, go back to A is for apple, B is for bat, you know, the flying kind of bat. Um, and, and we could do all that. And I think we could actually root, you know, people talk about, cross-curricular working and when my two boys were at primary school there was no art it had just gone it had disappeared it was just appalling really that the national curriculum had become so narrow that all that they were allowed to do was the three r's you know with very little everything else sort of shoehorned into a friday afternoon kind of thing this is not to criticize teachers of course you understand it's it's what teachers are asked to do um but um but so why not if this is the state that we're in, why not go back to, to rewriting the curriculum? And I know that there's a call to have a GCSE in natural history. Well, I would argue, let's start it at year, year when they're three, when they're in nursery school. Let's go right to the beginning and, and redesign a curriculum that allows people to grow up in that sense of wonder and respect. Why wouldn't we do that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And um, one um, sort of one ray of hope in all this is that the um, idea that the Eden North project on Morecambe Bay is promoting, which is the idea of an environmental curriculum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's something that, that um, perhaps we can explore on, on another occasion. Mm -hmm. But right now, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. Hmm. 
And although we can't offer our audience um, a book signing with a glass of wine <laughs> before their Sunday lunch, um, you can buy Karen's book, um, Abundance, complete with signed book play, directly from um, the Litfest bookshop, the online bookshop, which you'll find at www.litfest.org slash shop. Um, and that will help support Litfest too. But before we all go our separate ways, um, if you enjoyed today's event, don't forget to click on the donate button on your screen or go to our website afterwards if that's easier. Every penny will go towards creating exciting future projects and events and strengthening Litfest as an independent arts charity. So thank you for joining us today. I hope we may see some of you again at, at the two events yet to come, Monday's International Fiction Book Club with Juan Gabriel Vasquez, Colombian writer and his award-winning translator, Anne McLean, and the first Lancaster International Fiction Lecture, Fiction as the News, which will be given on Tuesday by Juan Gabriel Vasquez. But now it really is time to go. So please join me in thanking once again this lunchtime's wonderful um, writer and environmental activist, Karen Lloyd. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Bill.